you know, I coach just for fun with my kids' sports, right? I mean, I'm no no good at it or anything, but I wouldn't want my kids doing that, and they'd be punished if they did. But the reality of it is, it's um, it's relatively harmless in the grand scheme of things, right? Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. I was like, oh, okay, so he put his foot out and got somebody in the back of the knee. Like, what what's the big deal here? It's not like they're, uh, yeah, as you said, he's not sitting there drinking and driving. He's not sitting there taking dirty syringes and like hitting people like <laughs> as they're as they're driving by him or something. So that's right. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is the last podcast for 2016. What an incredible year it's been. Just some stats for your knowledge. So in October, we had a total of 18,000 listens. And at that time, we thought that was awesome. In November, we had 22,000. And in this month, in December of 2016, not including today's release, we're already at 29,000 downloads for this month. We used to be on average around 1,000 to 1,500 downloads per episode, but now we're somewhere in the range of 2,500 to 5,500, almost reaching 6,000, depending on the guest. This has been so much fun, and we need more suggestions to keep guests coming on. So if you have anyone in mind that would be good, please send us an email. It's the duo, T-H-E-D-U-O, at burnpursuit.com. And lastly, I got to thank everybody who supports us for this show. I know you've heard me say it for the past six months, and you're going to hear it from me again in 2017. But if you haven't supported us yet, please visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash burden pursuit to learn more about all the cool swag, such as t-shirts and koozies you get in return. Our sponsorship is what keeps this podcast going. Enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Burn Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here today, and this is a pretty exciting episode for us. We are wrapping up the year, and we're wrapping it up on a big note. You know, we've had, uh, you know, I guess you should say Ryan and I, we have a affinity and sort of a, I guess I'd say a, a uh, an attraction to everything Kentucky. But today is a one of the the major distilleries that is that are actually not inside of Kentucky, and I'm pretty excited because I've started hopping on the uh, the bandwagon i've got a few bottles from this distillery that are that are in my basement now and uh, i'm kind of really excited to kind of hear the story behind it so so ryan kind of kind of give us your thoughts as well yeah i'm super excited to figure or talk to, uh, to uh, smooth ambler and hear their story because i don't know much about them i I've, I've had some excellent private barrel picks from them the, of the old scouts from different liquor stores around the region but uh just really excited to hear their story because I don't know much about them, but I think I think they're definitely a, becoming a player in the bourbon market. I think so too. I think it's uh, we're going to have a, a great conversation today, especially about how they are really starting to overshine and overtake a lot of the, um, I guess you'd say that the craft distilling movement and really be a, a huge player in this. So today Absolutely. I want to welcome to the show as John Little. John is the vice president and head distiller at Smooth Ambler. So John, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be awesome. here. Thank you awesome. so much for taking your time out to come and uh, talk to us today. So I want to kind of get this started with a question we ask pretty much everybody that comes on the show is give us a little history about you before you got into doing Brown Spirits. Wow, that's the, the resume. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did a little bit of everything. I, I grew up in, in North Carolina, um, went to school in North Carolina, uh, Charlotte. And um, my my wife is from West Virginia, and and the, the brief history of that is we met about twenty three years ago or something. I was young; I was twenty one years old when we met. And um, she has family here in in West Virginia. So when my daughter was born, um, two thousand one, uh, late two thousand two. We kind of had a crazy idea that we that she wanted to be close to her folks, and we. Um, we just on, on the, on the drop of a hat, thank you. On the drop of a hat, we decided we were going to move to West Virginia. So, um, you know, really in a very short amount of time, we, we both quit our jobs, uh, moved up here so she could be close to family and, um, and you know, that my kid could have a, a very different lifestyle than, than what we had in Charlotte. You know, this is a small town. It's about 30, 3,500 people in the town, about guys, you know, from a big area. Um, the whole county here has about 35,000 people. So a very different living scenario than what we, than what we had previously. 
And so that's really how I ended up in West Virginia. I've been here since 2002. So 14, 14 and a half years or something. I've been, I've been in West Virginia and you know, this is really much pretty, what, what, what I call home now. And so I, I was, I was here and uh, I did a few things with my father-in-law. I was in business with him doing a variety of other things. But the thing that I loved the most was um, I was basically like a high end purchasing agent. So I procured um, furniture and fixtures and things of that nature for um, for hotels and resorts across the country. And we we had that business going on called Tag Signature. We had that business going on for about five or six years. And when the crash of 2008 happened, that pretty much ended our business, right? Then no, nobody was spending money in that, that world anymore. For before a while, for for a couple of years before that. So so maybe from 2005 to 2006 to 2008, we were always trying to look at a way to to bring business into our community, right? So a small community, a really, really wonderful place to live. Uh, Lewisburg, the town that we're closest to about four miles away, was was named the coolest small town in America. Um, about five or six years ago, it is a really, really interesting place to live with a lot of cool, cool things to do here. Lots of art, lots of culture in, in such a small town. And so we really wanted to create something here that, that added value to the people here. So we looked at all sorts of ideas. We looked at making furniture, uh, you know, making fabric, um, doing customer service, all sorts of really interesting ideas. And in March of 2008, my father-in-law, who I was in this, in this purchasing business with, uh, who's an architect, uh, he put an article from Time Magazine in my box. He read that on a flight from Denver back to, um, back to Lewisburg, and it talked about the growth of the micro distilling business. And it turns out Tuttletown, which is, you know, one of the first pe- people that ever really had, had a successful business and then sold to someone much larger, they were the focus of that article. And he tore that out. He wrote a little smart ass comment in the upper right hand corner of that, that, that article that said, we can do this in your garage. And he put it into my box and I read the article and pretty much instantly fell in love with it. And did some research, you know, just doing some Google search. And I found out that there was a conference called the ADI, which is now a a fairly big organization that had, um, that had a conference. Yeah. ADI had a conference about 10 or 12 days later. So it was maybe at the end of March is when I got the, the article and 10 days later, beginning of April, I was in, I was in Louisville touring Vendome and touring Four Roses and touring a variety of, uh, of folks in the business. And, and it pretty much in two days, I just fell in love with the whole idea. Um, so I had kind of a varied background. I, I have worked on cars to pay my way through college. I was in the drink business. Uh, I've messed with you know, sweating pipe and doing mechanical work. I also bartended, also took accounting classes. So my, my capabilities were sort of all over the place. I was the, the jack of all trades, master of none sort of thing. I always felt like that hurt me until I found the distilling business. And I, I felt like I was made for this business. And that sounds really crazy, but I feel like that that's one of the things that has really happened to me in this, in this, experiences that I felt like I found my calling in life, you know, so I'm, I'm, I was never the best at doing any one thing, but it really enabled me to run a small business fairly well. Um, and so I took a little care of a little bit of the counting and I know how to take care of the TTB compliance stuff. And I know how to track proof gallons and how all that stuff's done. And I also have known how to fix mechanical issues as they've come around. And, um, and I think it's been a real blessing for me to, to have found that in my life. And, what I always thought was a weakness, I think turned out to be a strength. And, and pretty much that's, that's how we ended up in the distilling business. That's how we ended up where we are here. That's my long winded. <laughs> you, said, you said I could be long winded. That's my long. Yeah, that's absolutely. My long-winded history. That's the most uh, unique story to start a distiller I've ever heard in my life. That's awesome. <laughs> I agree. What were, what were some of those, those, uh, you said, you know, you went to that conference and you toured four roses what were some of the, I guess, the some more of the inspirations behind it, right? I mean, you you had these ideas for businesses and 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 all that sort of thing, but is there more inspiration that was behind it when you got to see Four Roses, see their distilleries, and you said, you know, I could do this. I, I see what they're doing. There's great tradition, great history, and all this other kind of stuff that's focused around it as well. 
you, you know, I, look, we're not going to talk bad about any of those guys, but you know, every every time you tour any one of those, those distilleries, they all say that they're the oldest something. They're the oldest <laughs> continuous, a, the oldest in yeah, a certain it's, county, right? The, the reality is the same old spiel every time. Yeah, right. They, 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 all of them are the oldest of something. And the reality of it is, you know, they, they make all of those guys make really good distillate, right? It's, we, we, and we never fast forward a little bit. We never tried to say that, oh, it was us versus the big guys, right? We're those, the miracle is not only that they make such good juice, but they, that they make so damn much of it and that it's so good. So no matter which distillery you go to, all those guys make really, really good, really good distillate. I was less, I was less thrilled with the the marketing angle, the story of how long I've been doing it, the you know the the dream marketing story. I was less con- less thrilled with that than I was with the very like the mechanical nature of it. Vendome is really what what really sold me on it. When I walked into Vendome, I felt like, man, right, this is this is Willy Wonka here. This is this is it. And you're like an engineer at heart, then. I guess I like things that are mechanical. Um, I like the fact that it was, I, 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 I knew instantly that it was a little bit about creating a business and creating opportunity to, for people here and to have a really cool thing. But it also spoke to my mechanical nature and sort of my numbers. I mean, all the, all the people that you talk to on the production side who are all really wonderful to each other in the bourbon business, everybody I know who works in production treats the other people in production, no matter where they work, whether they work for their competitor or whatever, they're, they're really wonderful to each other. It's a small industry, right? And, and I love the fact that they're all numbers oriented and the science of it. The, the, you know, the, we've always used that term, um, you know, whiskey nerd. And I don't say that as like a mean thing. I say that as a, a badge of honor and all of these people, they're whiskey nerds. I mean, if you, if you talk to anybody who works in production, they geek out about everything about, yeast and aldehydes and you know copper exposure and dwell time and proof and i mean you would pick any term you want to do it the, these people are serious about their job they take everything to the nth degree they're obsessive all of that obsessive mechanical number thing really speaks to what i love so you have a lot so of I legos when you're a kid <laughs> my kid has a lot of legos that's right <laughs> but, rector sets yeah, yeah that's, that's right that's right so, so how did you learn about the distilling process? Because you, it sounds like you didn't have any background in it. I, I didn't, and and to be quite honest with you, I was I was very very green. Um, I took a couple of workshops. These are small things, but I took a couple of workshops uh, at Michigan State University. They had an artisan distilling program. So I I went and did uh, I went and did a couple of those. I went and worked in a friend's distillery. They'd only been open about a year or a year and a half when I had the idea. It's called Dry Fly. They're in Spokane, Washington. Uh, they've become friends of ours. And and really, the we've, I've used this saying a couple of times, and it's kind of the truth, which is the old saying, it takes a village to raise a family. It sort of took a village to raise this distillery. So we called everybody. We called yeast suppliers, grain suppliers, equipment suppliers, um, you know, pretty much anybody who would pick up the phone we spoke to. Uh, Todd Leopold at Leopold Brothers in, in Denver. He was a big inspiration and a big help for us. He he's been somebody who has always helped helped me from the get go when I had, um, you know, a fermentation issue or a production question or what what do I what do I do about whatever. He's always been there as a resource. And then about five years ago, we we hired a guy named Larry Ebersold. And most people don't know Larry, but Larry was the master distiller for the Seagram's facility in Indiana for about twenty five years. He's about as sharp as in the whiskey business as, as anybody out there. Um, and so he, he's been doing some consulting work with us for a number of years. Um, I, I had a yeast issue one time. I called our yeast suppliers. He put me on the phone with a nutrient supplier who put me on the phone with the master distiller for black velvet. And <laughs> right, these, this was when I was, this was six, five or six years ago when we were small and I'm, I'm over here making 30 gallons of vodka and this guy's making whatever 300,000 gallons of some spirit. And I'm on the phone with him. It must've been, must've been a complete pain in the neck for him, but the people out there, they're, they're willing to help. They're willing to share their knowledge. And, um, I think all of those factors enabled us to, to be where we are today. And, and to be quite honest with you, we, 
we have we still have a ways to go. We we continue to improve every single day. We we try our best to get better every day. And I was on the phone with Larry last night about something I wanted to change, tweak, not change, but tweak. And um, and you know, of course, our, our recent partnership with uh, with the Pernod family with NBV. That's going to enable us to to also speak to you know, to blenders, to master distillers, to engineers, and their other locations, and those are that's going to give us resources that we haven't had before, and that's that's only going to allow us to be better at what we do. Not so. Well, cool. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We'll kind of touch on that subject, but I, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about you know when you when you're sitting here and doing the exploring and you're you know you're learning through all this whole process you saw that you know a lot of the big players are where Ryan and I are located in here in Kentucky so what was your initial reaction to saying like well we can start this in West Virginia uh and then we'll kind of see what happens uh now I think it was a really stupid thing to do and we got <laughs> got lucky, got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a challenge it's been a challenge uh you know what we, we made and we made some mistakes along the way right uh, we tried to do the small barrel thing for us. It doesn't work. Um, you know, it's the, the whiskey gets too much wood and not enough time for oxidation. Uh, it's not balanced for us. So we tried that. It didn't really work for us. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think it was, I had, I had really good partners. It was my father-in-law uh, and T- Tag Gallion and then one other guy named Greg Parsegan. And, and they always believed in us. And so we kept trying to approve, improve and, um, in hindsight, it's really kind of a crazy thing to do because you're going up against the biggest, most skilled people with you know hundreds of years of experience, right? Combined experience, and it's a it's a monumental task to try to make whiskey better than the Four Roses of the world or the Buffalo Trace of the world. So, I guess one thing that we didn't really talk on it and kind of touch on it, you know, talk about Smooth Ambler for a bit and some of the offerings that you all have as well. So uh, we, we started off making vodka and gin and then making whiskey in our whatever spare time, you know, when we had down distillation time. Um, so we, we still make vodka and gin. We make a barrel aged gin and we make about four different mash recipes for whiskey. Pr- primarily, we make a weeded bourbon. Um, we make a rye bourbon, a rye whiskey and a wheat whiskey. That's predominantly what we make. Um, we will probably scale that back to two or three recipes in 17. And then we've done some experimental things over the past. What, what, so what, what really is on the shelf now is vodka, gin, barrel aged gin, um, and then the old scout line. And, and we started that about five years ago. So we originally brought out old scout bourbon and then we had the old scout rye, which is now gone. Um, we have contradiction, which is a blend of our, our yearling and a, a low rye, the old scout 10, so we we have a we had, we got got kind of crazy there for a while where we had so many products. Um, what we're what we're most famous for, obviously, is is Old Scout, um, the single barrels, and Contradiction. Those are those are our and now Old Scout American whiskey. Those are our most popular items. Cool. I want to talk on those here in a minute, but uh, talk about the Contradiction for a minute because I remember I think when it was first introduced, it might have been like two years ago, something like that. It might have been That's first right. introduced. Yeah. And I remember people were going crazy over it. So kind of talk about the blend. I'm, I'm not familiar with the term yearling. So kind of talk about that for a second. Yeah. So the first whiskey that we ever made was uh, a weeded bourbon. And we brought it out when it was in small barrels. We brought it out when it was about a year old. And it's continued to get older and older and older. So um, it has a – it's um, – it's a, an age stated bourbon, but there's no straight on the label. It's actually all straight now, but we basically just kept getting our batches older. So I think the first batch we had was maybe nine or 10 months old in small barrels. And then we brought out something that was like a year and two months or a year and three months. And now I think most of the yearling bottles are three years, three and a half years, three years, 10 months, something like that. It, it was what we made when we weren't making vodka and gin five or six years ago. We are, we'll stop selling yearling when our new properly mature weeded bourbon comes out. So we had yearling, it was intended to be a temporary thing. And then we wanted to have a mature spirit that we brought out, which is now we just call smooth ambler weeded bourbon. We'll bring it out right after the first of the year. We think Um, it's finally time to release it. It's five to six year old uh, whiskey, all in full size, 53 gallon barrels. Um, so, so we made, we've made yearling for a long time and we've continued to grow the production of that spirit. 
um, with two plan expansions. So we expanded uh, in 2011, right after, you know, a year after we opened, and then we expanded again last year when we went to a continuous column. So we had, we had the yearling that we made, that we've, we've made for a long time, and then we had Old Scout bourbon, and then one of the other, that was, which is a high rye bourbon, and then about two, a year, a year and a half after we brought out Old Scout bourbon, we brought out a 10-year-old low rye bourbon, also from Indiana. So we had Old Scout bourbon, the Old Scout 10, two different recipes. And I, I had an inspiration from uh, the Parker Heritage Master Distillers blend of mash bills. And Ooh, my wanted, favorite. I was about to say, you, you touched my product. all-time favorite it's spot right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a great product, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's really amazing. And, and so I wanted to see if we could do that. And so we played around with a bunch of different recipes uh, we are blending the high rye and the low rye and the, and the, uh, you know, the yearling, which is this weeded bourbon that we produce in house. And, and ultimately we, we made about four or five recipes, uh, blends, mingles, whatever, mingling marriages, whatever you want to really call it. Um, I say blend, but I think the proper term is mingling. Um, cause we're not diluting it down with NGS, but we made a couple of these marriages and we sent them off to, we had our favorite and we sent them off to two or three people who, whose opinion we think are, or pilots we think are really good and they all picked the same blend. And so what it, what it became was it was 73% um, low rye bourbon from Indiana that was at least nine years old with 27% weeded bourbon from West Virginia that was at least two years old. And we, we mingle those together and then we put them back into the same, we, so we, we, we mingle them together and then we, without, uh, without filtering anything, we put them right back into the same barrels that they came out of. So we don't finish them. They're just going right back into the same barrels that they came out of. And they stay together for uh, anywhere from two to four months. And then we, we you know, dump them and, and do a slight filtration on the removed bits of the barrel and then put them back into, or put them into a bottle. Um, and so, our first batches were delicious. We're really, really proud of them, but we've also got better at blending. We also know uh, we ha have a few tricks about how we, about how we mingle those things and about how they stay in the barrels. And so I think our, uh, I think our contradiction has gotten better over time, just as we've gotten better as distillers and we've gotten better as, as blenders over time. And, and of course, you know, pe people tell us that they can taste the young juice in there and, you know, that, you hear all sorts of, if you read Reddit, if you're a distiller and you read Reddit, well, you better be prepared to hear every negative <laughs> comment in the world. It's like a author reading in Amazon reviews. <laughs> exactly right. You know, it's a hard thing to get, it's a hard thing to get over, which is when you make something that is available for public consumption, um, a lot of people aren't going to like it. And the old <laughs> joke that I always say here is, you know, half the people in the world don't like Pepsi but they've figured out how to make it work pretty well. It seems so, <laughs> um, so um, but, but you know, what was really good for us is, you know, we sent that product into uh, last year, we sent it and the single barrel into the world whiskey awards. And we didn't pick a cherry barrel. We didn't pick, um, we didn't pick specific blends of contradiction that were better than the others. The reality of it was, this is a really cool story. So I was trying to find out exactly where contradiction fit in, uh, in the competition, were they going to consider it a blended, even though it's a blend of straight bourbons. Um, and so I was trying to get some feedback from them and sort of at the last minute they came back and said, Hey, we're just going to put it in the bourbon category because it really is. There's just two straight bourbons, right? One from Indiana and one from West Virginia. And so we submitted it and the single barrel. And I literally went into our sample room, pulled the first two single barrels that had the same barrel number and two bar bottles of contradiction, dropped them in a box and shipped them over to the competition. And, you know, that's when we won world's best single barrel. And that was really good for our business and good for our, for marketing. But we were more proud of the fact that the contradiction went up against the best in the whiskey business and won a gold medal. It was one of five gold medals given at the world whiskey awards. I'm probably more proud of anything that I've ever been. That was probably the most proud of anything that we've ever done here in terms of an award, because you know, we made a piece of it. We, the blend was our idea the actual blending, the mingling that we do all that in house. And so it, it felt like that was more about what our future was about. And so we were really, really excited to go up against the, the big boys and, and perform well.
That's awesome. That's a great story behind it. I also want to kind of talk about some of the names that you you kind of guarded up behind this as well. Old Scout, uh, Contradiction, the word smooth ambler. Like what are the what's the meaning behind a lot of these? So, yeah, these are good questions. So when when we were trying to figure out the name, the working name of the distillery was something like you know, Greenbrier Distillers or something. Um, Greenbrier County Distilleries. That was just our working name when we first had the project. And so we wanted to come up with something that spoke to all of us. Um, you know, all of our, all the owners here. Um, and so we, we came up, uh, we, we hired a marketing company to help us and some, some of it was just brainstorming and they actually came up the, with the name Amble. We, we were looking at something that, that, that spoke to us and spoke to the region and a horse that ambles an amble is a, is a gate between a walk and a run. And immediately when we heard it, we loved it because, um, you know, that people think that, that people from West Virginia are, are just a bunch of dumb hicks. And of course, some of us coal are miners. Yeah, a bunch of coal miners. And, and but the reality of it is, is that you know, most people here are making a choice to live in West Virginia because, you know, that they love it. They love something about being here. They love this pace of life. And so but it, it really meant a lot to us. We're, we're not quite a walk, not quite a run. We're somewhere in between. And this is the pace that we that we love life. And so Smooth Ambler became a really important thing to us. Now we rejected it for about four months. And the reason we rejected it now seems very small, but there's a very prominent family where we live called the Amblers and their last name is Ambler. And, and um, I just didn't want there to be a tie in to them, not because we love them, but just because we didn't want people to get confused or to, for them to feel like they were being uh, infringed on. Right. And the reality of it is, is uh, we just told them that we hope they liked it. And we, we did it anyway, <laughs> after about four months of struggle. Deal with it. Kept, yeah. Deal with it. And, yeah. You always um, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Right. Yeah, that's right. And the reality of it is outside of Lewisburg, nobody knows, right. And it's only important in, in this little bitty town or in this little bitty region. And, and it turns out that, you know, they're, they have kids that are about the same age as, as my kids. And so we see them at all sorts of sporting events. They're, they're really wonderful people. They've been supportive of us. Um, his wife likes to joke, his wife named Linda, who is my little, my son's little teacher. I and mean, this is like, this is like America in 1950s. Right. So, um, his, his wife, Linda is, uh, is my son's teacher. And she says that she just wants enough commission or, um, uh, royalties to yeah. Yeah, residuals, residuals <laughs> to go buy a nice pair of shoes once a year. <laughs> in perpetuity yeah they're, they're really wonderful they're really wonderful folks so so when we were developing that name smooth ambler there were two two other names that we came up with one of which i'm not going to tell you i'm sorry but i keep that secret because it's so bad the other one is actually <laughs> old scout old scout was a name we were looking at for the distillery so we had no intention of of buying whiskey of sourcing whiskey but when that became an option and we were like, oh, we're sourcing this stuff out. John Foster, our sales guy, who is brilliant. He does all of our, right? He does all of the wordsmith work. So the back of the label, um, anything that we write as a press release, anything we put on social media is pretty much coming out of John's mouth. Um, and, and he said, you know, Old Scout is teed right up for this. He goes, we scouted it out. We sourced it out. Um, this is what we do. And it, it, it couldn't have been more of a home run for us. And so it was sort of just sitting there on deck. It, it felt like fate for it to, for it to be sitting there and for it to be, uh, as it turns out, right. The part that we've made, made our business out of. I bought a buddy of mine, a bottle of old scout cause his dog was named scout. And that's, that's why I bought it. So there you go. Per- perfect. <laughs> he yeah. appreciates your business, Ryan. Yeah. So exactly. I, this- yeah, this was a, a kind of a, a pretty good question that, that came up on one of the forums. And, you know, the one thing that that we like to see is that you're very transparent, right? You you don't you don't sit there and hide the fact that, you know, you source it from MGP and, and you got it from from Indiana. And that's that's awesome. Uh, and then Ryan Lentz brought up a question that says, well, why does Smooth Ambler's MGP source bourbon taste so much better than others? Uh, is it because it's bottled at cash strength or is it just a, a mental thing because everybody's jumping on the hype train for the uh, the single barrels? Wow, I'm treading in some dangerous water now. Well, for, first of all, thank you. We we try to be very transparent. We we we, we want to be that way in our in our 
personal lives and our business lives, we we want to be honest folks, right? For for good or bad, we want to be open and honest and shoot people straight. Um, nobody nobody wants a reenactment of Templeton Rye, so <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay away from that comment. So <laughs> yeah. so um, I think what makes our product different is the fact that uh, a couple of things, and I and I really believe this, we um, we are very good about leaving the original flavor intact. So we don't chill filter. We have a very specific filtration method that we use that basically we believe just removes the bits of the barrel to make sure there's no, I mean, you can, you can strain char off of a screen and still have all sorts of little, like almost like charcoal dust. Right. Um, and we, we have a way that we think that removes that very well and, and still leaves lots of flavor in the spirit. I mean, you can over filter anything. Right. Um, we were very, very careful about that, and we've worked with it. <clears throat> excuse me for for a number of years. We're obsessive about our water, and I know everybody is obsessive about our water. But um, you know, we have a, a sediment filter and a carbon filter and three reverse osmosis filter and a water deionizer and a UV light. And so we we take we take water that is you know 150 parts per million of dissolved solids, and we take it down to 0.1 parts per million of dissolved solids. It's about as pure and clean as, as any water I've ever had. Um, and we all drink it here. We use it in the tasting room. Some of our employees actually you know, have their own bottles that they fill them up here at work and then take them and use them at water coolers at home. It's delicious. And I do think it matters. Um, so I think it's, I think it's all of those things. Well, good deal. On so, the aging process too, right? Yeah, well, you know, most of that stuff stored at MGP, where where other people store spirits. You know, some of those oh, okay, bar- gotcha. some of those barrels are stored here for as much as a you know, two or three years, and and that might have something to do with it. We we think there might be a tie into you know basically aging in Indiana and then finishing in in West Virginia, but I I can't be certain that that's real. I don't have evidence to say that that is one hundred percent accurate, but we we feel like it it has something to do with it. I mean, every tour you go on around here, they're always like, oh, Kentucky's the best for aging bourbon because of the hot summers and the cold winters. But West Virginia is pretty much on the same line as as as, as us, right? I mean, the the, the variable amount of, of fluctuations you have in your weather is, is pretty much on par with what Kentucky has as well. Yeah, I think that's right. just get it right. a day later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. That is right. When y'all get a storm, we get it a day later, everything. The, the reality yeah. of it is we're, we're about 2,200 feet. So we're cooler than most of most of Kentucky, um, Greenbrier County is, and uh, so I think we're seven degrees cooler, something like that, than than Kentucky. We have done a few things to help with that. We do think that you guys have a little bit hotter summers. We're jealous of, and then when you when people in Kentucky build multi-story rickhouses, you know, those top floors get really really hot. We everything we use is single story. So the last rickhouse we built. Uh, the last three brick, brick houses we built are all black. So they're black ceiling or sorry, black roof, black sides. Uh, and so those buildings are actually, and they're turned in a direction which gets better sunlight. Um, and so I think that'll help us get the higher temperatures that we want to create. We, we wish we were five to seven degrees warmer. And I think we're going to get that in our new buildings. Oh, get a little bit of uh, climate change. that's going to happen with, you know, President Trump being in here, he's not going to worry about it. So I'm, I'm sure that we have no problem uh, seeing some warmer summers here coming along. Uh, yeah, so, you, yeah. so you already hinted at the fact that the the old Scout Rye is pretty much done with right now. And it seems like at this point, people, they just can't get enough of the old Scout single barrel picks. So is that something that you're going to be continuing on for, for a while? Because it seems like there's just a huge demand in the market. We'll be doing... No, we'll we'll do some of that. We won't do as much as we've done in the past. And but the reality of it is, it's not a, a situation that's you know about the new deal that we've just made. It's about the fact that we're this business has been wildly successful, more than we ever dreamed. And quite frankly, we we were behind. I'm behind. It's my fault um, by not buying new make or buying whiskey at a greater rate. Uh, and so we are running out of of product to make the single barrels and the custom barrel picks. And we're going to have to do something about that in the new year to change that. Um, I say that they are suspended, not discontinued. 
we're buying new make and we're buying uh, one to two to three, or we're buying whatever we can find. We're buying juice that we think is good quality in order to support the line in the future. It might, might take us two years to get back on track or even three years, but we're buying product now. We're making more product now. We're going to continue to make more product, but we're also buying distillate so we can get back on track uh, with, with the Old Scout Rye, with the Old Scout Bourbon, or at least products similar to that. So we're, we're doing both and we're trying to catch up. But at some point in time, we're going to have a supply issue. What about the very old scout? Are we going to see that ever again? There's a chance you might see it in 14 or in 17. All right. Mm -hmm. so All right. Everybody take, everybody yeah. take note. It's going to be a <laughs> bad rush. Uh, and be so, camping out. <laughs> it's, it's Kentucky is what we do. So <laughs> yeah. You we kind of you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, and it was the biggest news as of late. It was it was back on December eighth. Was that Pernod Ricard has taken a majority stake in your company? So first off, congratulations. I hope that Thank means you. there's going to be a, a new Ferrari in your driveway soon. But what <laughs> what is what else does that mean for you as a business? Well, first, I don't have a new Ferrari in my drive. Um, it's kind of funny because all, all of my friends um, have been saying the same thing. Um, the reality of it is last Tuesday and Wednesday, I think I worked 16 hours a day. So it didn't seem like it, it was getting any easier for, for me. Um, <laughs> it, it means a lot for us. So I already spoke a little bit about what it means from the technical side of it. But, you know, as a small business owner, it's hard to be in charge of, of human resources and in charge of safety and taxes and you know, all the things that go along with, with being a business owner. And at some point in time, it becomes more about running the business than it does about making whiskey and selling whiskey. And this partnership gives us the resources to what I, what I alluded to earlier. It gives us the resources to make more distillate here, to add more jobs here and to give opportunity to both our existing employees and people in the community who might otherwise not have those opportunities. It allows us to buy more distillate from MGP it allows us to go to market with a, an experienced, you know, a very experienced team. But most importantly for us, it gives us the, the, the resources to, to that the back office part, the technical part of what we do, the stuff that we don't like to do really, you know, accounting taxes, compliance, whatever that is, somebody else does that. And that's their full-time job. And, the, and we have the ability to go focus on what we want to do which is to, as I said, is to make whiskey and sell whiskey. And that's the part that we want to do. And this partnership gives us the ability to do that. We, we couldn't be more thrilled with the people that we, we have here. Um, the you know, people that we know that, that work for, you know, this is the company that's, that's buying into Smooth Ambler is an affiliate um, of Pernod called NBV. But everybody that we know that works for NBV, they're, they're good people. They like the organization. They have family values like we do. The reality of it is they really want to leave us alone and let us do what we do and give us the resources to be successful. And that's the part that thrilled us. Um, we're, I, I mean, I, I'm, you know, in the first week of uh, January, you know, me and Andrew Robinson, who's our processing manager, and Paul Jackson, who's our production manager, the three of us fly to Hiram Walker in Canada, and we meet with the, you know, the director of operations for, um, for North America. Uh, for Pernod North America and, and a team of people. And so we get to ask questions to people that we, maybe we, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't even know without this relationship. And so we're just really excited about what this means for, for our whole team and, and how much better we can, we make, we can make our product, how much better we can be in the future. Well, that's you awesome. think they would, uh, you think they would want to buy a lawn and pest control company? <laughs> I hate doing all that shit also. <laughs> back off the shit. It's, you know what? They might want to diversify. Uh, exactly. And, and you know, it, it really is awful, isn't it? I mean, you know how much how much time you spend doing stuff that really doesn't improve. Oh, non-revenue producing. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly right. Non-revenue producing. Stuff that doesn't help your business. Well, it's great. Yep, exactly. Well, I, we're kind of running the top of the hour. So, John, I do want to say thank you um, for coming on the show today and kind of sharing your story behind it. I also want to uh, probably extend a big thank you to everybody in the bourbon community for having your dad pull out that that magazine article and put it in front of you because <laughs> yeah, I think what you guys have done is uh, is nothing short of incredible by you have a, a almost a, a cult following, I guess you could say. And, and with that, you know, it, it, it does, it spreads it. You know, I can say for myself, 
a year and a half ago, people were like, you got to try this stuff. And I was like, ah, West Virginia, MGP, whatever. I'm not even going to try it. And then probably six months ago, <laughs> Snob. six months ago, I was like, <laughs> I tried it for my first time. I was like, okay, I'm a believer. Now I got three bottles in my basement. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that, you know, I've, I'm starting to jump on the bandwagon as much as anybody else. So thank you. Yeah. Th- thanks. Yeah. Guys. I, I tell you, you're, you're exactly right. We, I feel like we have the best fans, uh, in the business. Uh, we have a great relationship with all of them. We have a great crew here that really treats everybody like family when they come here. Um, and, 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 you know, we're, we're really, really proud of that relationship. We, I try to be active on Facebook and so does the rest of our team so that people feel like they can really connect to us. And that's important. You know, we, we want people to feel like, you know, we're not some cold corporation. We're, we're all really here trying to make whiskey and support our families, just like everyone, just like all you guys are doing the same thing too. Um, and it really means a lot for you to say that really we're, we're proud of what we make and we're proud of the relationship we have with, with everybody who supports us. And it means a lot. Awesome. So if yeah. anybody does want to get in contact with you, John, or they kind of want to know more about your story, whether you're on Twitter or the Facebook groups or anything like that, how could, they, how could they uh, ask you a question? Well, um, you can go to smooth ambler on Facebook. You can do Twitter, same thing. It's all smooth ambler. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're all there. Uh, I do a little bit of that. Some other folks here do a little bit of that. I try to be available by anybody who sends me a message on Facebook. Um, or you can call the distillery. It's really simple. Well, awesome. Well, I'm glad you have those Twitter accounts and that the, uh, the amblers in town, their their teenage son didn't take it, thinking he was, he was <laughs> right. <having cooling. laughs> well, awesome. Uh, and also follow anything of uh, Bourbon Pursuit on social media as well. Uh, Twitter and Instagram at Bourbon Pursuit, Facebook.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And if you do like what you hear, make sure you support the show on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Yep. Thanks, John, again. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I used to think the only good thing that come out of West Virginia was Patrick Patterson for uh, UK basketball. But I was going to say Bob Huggins is Ambler. a pretty popular name too, right? So they're this, yeah. Yeah, he's a celeb but, here, man. Yeah. For sure, for sure. But no, it's, what y'all are doing is awesome, and I'm looking forward to the very old scout um, in 2017. If you could, when we end this, just let us know when it's coming out, and we'll plan accordingly. <laughs> I said maybe. I said, yeah. yeah. Well, guys, I really okay. appreciate it. Seriously, thanks for having me. I, this has been great. This has been really low key and um, very relaxed, and I really appreciate it. We awesome. try to make it that way. All right. Well, y'all have a good ho- holiday, and we'll see you next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey. For those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com.